Oi pessoal, então a gente continua na série de vídeos do pré simpósio e hoje a gente tem o enorme prazer de entrevistar o professor Mike Bigan. É, bom, ele é autor desse livro, que certamente vários de vocês conhecem. So, Bigan, it's a pleasure to, 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 to interview you for this show, for this pre symposium. And uh, first of all, we all know you by, by your book. So uh, I would like you to introduce yourself a bit to, to give us a bit more of a person that is behind the book. Okay, well, um, I have been involved over a number of years now in, in writing these ecology textbooks and, and the book that, uh, that you have there, I guess, is, is the biggest of those. And, and if, if, if I've made any contribution, my major textbook contribution, uh, I've also tried to maintain some kind of a career as a scientific ecologist and for many years now my interest has been the role of infectious disease in natural populations uh, and in particular um, populations that are reservoirs for diseases that can be spilled over into humans. So I've tried to, to maintain both a, a research career and, and a textbook writing career as well. Excellent. And one thing that comes to my mind when you talk about your scientific background is that uh, we are now in this conservation crisis and uh, well diseases are um, today probably a main part of conservation and just give us some thoughts about how your your conservation in your field is important and how you think it's well, necessary. Yes well certainly uh, I mean of, of the various agents that are threats to, to species, uh, conservation threats. Disease is one of those. I mean, it's, I'm not sure that it's the most important, but it's certainly one that we, that we often uh, have to consider. And I think, in particular, um, it becomes a conservation threat in, in rather the same way uh, as I am interested in these diseases passed from wildlife reservoirs to humans. When diseases cross species barriers, Uh, often um, the movement of a species into a new area may bring a disease with it. I mean, we have an example uh, very close to home in, in the UK of an American grey squirrel bringing a viral infection that has killed uh, the, the native red squirrel from a very large part of Britain. That's one example local to us, but I, I think it, it illustrates how important disease can be in conservation as well. Well, excellent. And, and uh, shifting, shifting to the book, uh, how do you think that textbooks, not yours only, but a textbook is, is necessary to increase awareness of people uh, to conservation issues and, and to improve the, like, the actions that we, should, we can take? Well, I like to think that it has some kind of a role, of course. I mean, otherwise, I guess I wouldn't be involved in it. But it's, it can only be a small part of that. I think what we hope we are providing is a tool that um, teachers, in the broadest sense, can use um, to direct students to, to fill in details. Um, but uh, in the end, conservation in particular, but, but many other things as well, require upon um, students being inspired, not just informed. Uh, and the balance between being inspired and being informed, I suppose, is different between a textbook Uh, and the teacher. So I think the textbooks hopefully provide some inspiration, but provide a lot of information. But it is at least as important, I think, um, or more important, much more important, I should say, uh, that, that the teachers who are have the balance slightly differently. It's their role to be inspirational. In the end, if students aren't interested, then it doesn't matter how much useful Uh, information is in the textbook, it, it, it means nothing. Uh, and so, and, and that is, is what, the, what the teaching environment provides that the textbooks never can. Well, that's an amazing answer. I'm very, very like, emotional to, to hear that. Uh, and, well, as you said, the textbooks are only a small part of, 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 the, of what can be done. And what other tools you, you can, that comes to your mind, that come to your mind when you think about teaching conservation to, to people when getting this feeling of I need to preserve nature. Sure. I think really, um, I don't think this is only true of, of conservation, I think people like us who are already 
engaged in the field never need convincing that the problems that we are studying are important. I mean, maybe we were even born believing that, but certainly by the time we have become involved, that is already embedded within us. I think what we sometimes underestimate is the extent to which the audience that we're trying to, to reach has not yet been convinced that they should even be interested. And I think it's, in the case of conservation, there are difficulties in just the textbook inspiring people to do that. And even in teachers in, in, a, in a classroom, I think in the end, you need to take students out into the field. You need, to, you need for them to feel, emotionally feel, the, um, the need for conservation first. And then they will carry that emotion back into the classroom and back to their reading of the textbook. You've got to, you've got to get them in a position where they're saying, I want to know more. And then we're in a position to say, well, I can tell you more. But the, that first step, them wanting to know more, I think has to be done with them out in, in a field situation. For most people, some people perhaps intrinsically are engaged with that kind of thing, but most people are not. Yeah, and for those that are intrinsically engaged, well, we don't need much. They, no. they, 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 they are what they are. Yes, indeed. But one thing that, well, at least from my point of view, one of the harder things to, to explain our well, our findings and what we believe uh, that is what well, is uh, right in science is is the fact that what is the most beautiful thing in science is also the the, most, the hardest hardest thing to to explain to people is that we we disagree with each other and this is good this is okay in science but when you go to the public to the to the general public I mean and show a result of, of research that is being questioned by other researchers. Uh, it, it can be like shifted as, an, as a counter argument of they don't agree between each other, so why should I agree with them? Uh, do you, well, I would like to hear your comments and, and how this is a problem for conservation, for example. Well, I think, I mean, you put your finger on what could be said to be the biggest problem facing us, which is engagement, not just with the public, but with politicians and so on as well. And the fact that um, the public and politicians want answers. Um, they are, we, we would like them to be uh, appreciative of our uncertainties and so on, but they're not appreciative of them. They take it as weakness or ignorance, particularly because there are often others. I mean, in the case of conservation, if there is an argument between somebody who wants to conserve species and somebody who wants to exploit that environment, those exploiters will feel no compunction in saying they have the answers, there is no problem, and leave it at that. And if we then come across as hedging our bets, saying, well, we think this is the, tr the case, but it might not be, then I'm afraid that we will just continue to lose those arguments. We do it on the grounds of a kind of a scientific integrity, but I think it's come to the point now where we have to choose between scientific integrity, as so interpreted, and winning arguments. And in the end, I would say that winning arguments is more important. The, 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 the maintaining integrity is done for us personally, but there is a bigger picture here. If we're worried about the species, if we're worried about conservation, I think we must be prepared to be as certain as the opposition is, even if we don't feel it. And I think this is a controversial thing to say, and I think many other ecologists would disagree with me, but that happens to be my opinion. Excellent. Uh, and we talked about inspiration here, uh, in this, and this symposium is like for lots of undergrads and graduate students. Uh, I would like to, you, to, if you can give a, like, an inspirational message, like a message for, for, for people that are coming and uh, engaging in this good fight that we, we are fighting. Okay, well, um, I can't promise to be inspirational, but I mean, I, I, I would say that, um, and, and it's been said now over, over a number of years, but it becomes truer and truer with the years, that we are facing crises that we are facing crises
that need to be addressed on a very short time scale. Older generations, the likes of me, you know, frankly, have failed in, in this kind of headlong loss of biodiversity, headlong loss of ecosystem services. I think we who write the textbooks look to the students, really, to not so much to provide the answers, though that is part of it, but to provide the vitality and the drive and the enthusiasm uh, and not to feel that all is lost. Uh, I think a great deal can still be done, but it's, it's the generations coming through that have to do this, and I'm sure can do this. Excellent. Thanks very much. Pessoal, então, a gente teve essa excelente entrevista, não posso estar, dizer outra palavra senão que eu estou emocionado, e espero que vocês tenham gostado e que estejam tão emocionados quanto eu estou.